you're listening to the Knicks Recap, your source for all New York Knicks-related content. And welcome to another episode of the Knicks Recap, your source for all New York Knicks-related content. I'm your host, Troy, and don't forget to hit that notification bell so that way you can get updated with all of our latest episodes. We have a lot of Knicks-related topics to discuss today and a lot of uh, NBA news to talk about. Chet Holmgren, I don't know if you heard about that injury. We're going to be talking about that. And uh, Patrick Beverly, is he moving? We're going to talk about that too. But before I get to any of that, joining me today to discuss this and more is the author of the book, Wine and Gold, former Cleveland Cavaliers lead writer and current NBA writer for Bleacher Report, for actually a little over 12 years now. Uh, that's a huge milestone. <laughs> Please help me welcome Greg Schwartz to the show. How's it going today, Greg? Oh, it's going really great. Thanks for having me on. Of course. You know, uh, read your articles a bunch. I'm sure a lot of our listeners have as well, too. Um, you're, uh, again, you're you're basically a GOAT for Bleacher Report. 12 plus <laughs> years. I mean, that's a, that's a hell of an accomplishment. Just to speak a little bit about... 12 years at Bleacher Report. How does it feel to kind of reach that milestone? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I started in 2010. Um, it was like right after LeBron made the decision, which seems like a lifetime ago. Um, and I, I remember just submitting an article that was writing kind of about like how moving from Cleveland to Miami was going to affect his legacy and I submitted it and got approved at the time. And it's just, everything's kind of snowballed from there. So I've been very, very thankful that they've kept me on for, I'm getting ready to enter my 13th season covering the league there. So that's, yeah, it's been pretty cool. I can only hope that the Knicks recap can uh, claim 13 years of uh, continued success as well. Congratulations on that. Like I said, it's a, Thanks. it's a hell of an accomplishment. Um, so just going into some of the articles that you've written and fans, if you haven't uh, read any of these articles, just listen to some of the articles that he's uh, written so far. So a number of them, you probably heard of them before. Some of them made you mad. Some of them made you happy. And some of them may be a little bit in between. Uh, some of them he's written was, uh, which 2022 NBA offseason moves will look the worst in three years. I'm not going to spoil that, uh, but it's a real fun one to read. Ranking the 10 most underrated moves of the NBA offseason. I uh, definitely agree with you, by the way, with uh, Dante uh, DiVincenzo. I'm not going to say where he lands, but oh my goodness, what a underrated signing. Doesn't get talked about uh, enough. And of course, predicting the biggest 2022 NBA free agency uh, overpays this offseason. A lot of Nick fans will definitely want to read that as well, too. Um, and so many great others. But we're going to talk about a couple of uh, ones that he wrote today, specifically ranking NV every NBA uh, team's three best future prospects. So... To start with this, before we get into the meat of the article, I just want to let Nick fans understand there's a <laughs> Greg use criteria here. And I a lot of times what happens is they scroll to read the teams without reading the criteria. So let's let's go ahead and uh, help them out here. So in order to be on this list for this three best prospects, you had to have three boxes checked. You have to be 21, 23 years age or younger. So, yes, fans, OB is not on the list, uh, have been in the NBA for three years or less are on a standard or guaranteed contract for 2022-2023 season. All right. We good? All right. Now, with that being said, uh, you know, let's jump right into it. Obviously, there's a bunch of notable teams, Greg. You mentioned the Hornets, the Pelicans, the Cavs. Uh, you know, they all come to mind with these great cores. Um, I want to just jump into the Knicks really quickly in terms of the core that you stated. So for fans that haven't read it, I'm sure you're going to read it after the show. The top three chosen by Greg was R.J. Barrett, Cam Reddish, and Emmanuel Quickly. So before we get into the actual list, obviously Barrett, as you said, is the best of the bunch. Given what you've seen from Barrett, what do you think and expect for him to turn into this moment well, into this season? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I really liked him at Duke. I thought he was a guy, you know, obviously before Zion took off that he could get an, a number one overall pick in the draft. Uh, he was a guy that I really wanted the Cavs to get at the time. I thought he was a perfect fit. Um, you know, you look at his size, his scoring ability, um, the way he's improved uh, in his first three years in the league. I mean, he's everything. If he can reach his potential, he's everything an NBA team could want, um, especially in such a wing dominated league. Um, I know he, he's probably looking for that max contract hasn't happened yet. 
Um, and I, I don't think he quite deserves one yet either. And I'll say that. I thought um, the start of last year, he got off to such an amazing start. Uh, I wrote an article at the time that was like, you know, predicting uh, guys that were going to make their first all-star game last year. And he was on my list. He got off to such a good start. Um, his ability to score at all three levels, his, his improved playmaking, I thought was better. Um, but, you know, that being said, he's still going to have the most efficient season. Um, right. I'd love to see that three point percentage go up. I'd love to see his overall field goal percentage go up. Um, I love him. I mean, I, he's improved as a playmaker, but that's still an area that he could grow in. Um, and then if, you know, the next step is becoming a lockdown defender, which I, he's not an all defense caliber guy yet, um, but he has the tools to be. So I don't blame the Knicks for not giving him a max contract yet. Uh, I kind of compare his situation to if you think a, a couple years back, Brandon Ingram, when he got traded yes. from the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, to the Pelicans, um, the Pelicans had a chance to give him a max contract extension. They chose not to. Uh, Ingram bet on himself. They went through the season um, in year four and Ingram had a, a monster year and it was a no brainer. OK, now we give him a max. And I think we could see a very similar situation play out this year with R.J. Barrett, where he's like, OK, you don't you don't think I'm you don't think I'm worthy of it. Let me show you. And I think that would be a great scenario for both, because then R.J. gets his money. Uh, the Knicks don't feel bad about giving him a max contract. Then there's no hesitations. OK, he's, he's clearly that guy. Um, that's a situation I, I absolutely can see play out. And, you know, I just want to mention for fans who don't know the two other top uh, draft picks from that class in John Morant and Zion Williamson, even with Zion Williamson's, you know, contract exceptions and things of that nature that he has to hit in order to get those max dollars still got max contracts. And if you're RJ with that huge chip on his shoulder, I mean, you mentioned it before. He has a lot of confidence. He obviously believes in himself. He's grew, He's grown every year. I know f- from three-point range, as you said, he did drop a little bit last year. But his turnovers obviously got better last year as well, too. He got better as a defender as well. Um, better keeping people in front of him. Stronger finishing with his right as well, too. Not going left so much. So, you know, he's improved in a lot of areas, as you mentioned. But, again, I agree. I don't think he's worth max dollars right now. He, he's just – if you compare the numbers or just compare the – just compare Ja – and RJ. And I don't want to say Zion because when he came in, he was just seen as a generational talent. Even that one season that he gave you where he made an all-star appearance, again, it was a good season. You saw some good things from him and he could probably do better. But with RJ Barrett, if you look at the difference between a John ja Morant led team and an RJ Barrett led team, I think it's all the difference you need to understand why he doesn't deserve it yet. But I agree right. with Greg. He absolutely can earn it. Go ahead. And you said the, you know, you mentioned the number one and the number two pick in the draft. Well, the number five pick in the draft got a max contract too. Darius right. Garland from the Cavaliers. So mm-hmm. uh, DeAndre Hunter at number four, I, he's not going to get a max, but he could certainly get paid if he has a good season. So right. um, really all those guys around Barrett kind of, a lot of them got paid and he, he certainly could be the next one to do so. And uh, speaking of uh, other picks around Barrett, there's another Nick on that list, uh, Reddish. So Nick's Twitter um, kind of got at me, for, uh, not really got at me, but they, you know how Nick's Twitter is sometimes. You, you speak a little thing to an existence and then they take it to a, an extreme. So uh, they obviously want to put Grimes in there. They, they asked, why wasn't it RJ quickly and Grimes? And the reasons that they gave, and it, it, I think it's, this point is particularly valid. Grimes, even after the trade, played more than Reddish. Although, again, people have to understand Reddish was injured for quite some time, didn't have time to gel with the team. And if you know anything about Thibodeau, he has a pretty locked in 10 man rotation and it's going to take a lot to uh, kind of divert from that. So just want to put that out there. So, yeah, I just want to go ahead and let you answer that. So why wasn't Grimes uh, on there in favor of, you know, in favor of Reddish, really? Yeah, so I, I I hedged a little bit on there, and I put like okay, like as my number three, I said okay, you could take Emmanuel quickly or Quentin Grimes. Um, I'd like to see a little bit more from Quentin Grimes. You know, obviously, I think he's a terrific prospect. Um, I think he's a guy that could play a really big role uh, for the Knicks this season or the Utah Jazz if a trade goes through. Um, uh, but I I, I think uh, I yeah, it, that's fair to put him on there. I guess I still like Cam Reddish. And maybe that's me being foolish, um, but I just feel like, be it injuries, be it, you know, obviously not a, a regular rotation member um, on the Knicks after the trade last year, I just feel like he hasn't got a 
full season to kind of prove what he can be. And we got a little taste of it in the playoffs with the Hawks uh, two years ago at this point where he came in and he was hitting three pointers and playing lockdown defense and everybody's yeah. like, Oh my God, this guy's the next Paul George. Like he's right. got the perfect frame. Uh, he's got, you know, the body type, he's got the athleticism and I, I'm not ready to give up on him. I'm not. And he's still only like 22 years old. Uh, I know, it, you know, we, we talked about RJ Barrett's shot efficiency improving. Cambra's uh, shot of, of efficiency really needs to improve. Um, yeah. But yeah. that, that happens when you get consistent minutes and a consistent role. And you know, you know, that if you go out and you miss a couple of shots, you're not going to get pulled. And I feel like, you know, how high could have his confidence could have been last year playing for the Knicks when he probably didn't know, you know, am I going to get five minutes tonight, 10 minutes? Am I going to play? Um, I, I still really like Cam Reddish as a two way um, force, as a really good defender, as a guy that can play the passing lanes. I love, like I said, I love his, his frame at six foot eight, what he can do. I just think if you give him, I don't want to say you make him a starter, but if you can give him at least, you know, 25 minutes off the bench and just put him in a consistent role, I think you're going to see a really good NBA player. Maybe if, maybe he's never an all-star and certainly a, he had the potential to be at one point, but yeah, I still really like Cam Reddish and I think the Knicks still have a really good player um, somewhere in there with him. Cam Reddish, again, he has a lot of upside. I still, I, I, again, I don't think we've seen enough of Cam Reddish to really make it. It's crazy, right? He's been in the league for quite some time, but we're, we're just now saying he really hasn't had a fair shake, and really he hasn't. I mean, in Atlanta, riding the bench a lot, uh, you know, too many. He, they, and Atlanta had so many draft picks. I mean, so many people to play in front of him. And he was in, and for what is worth, he was injured quite a bit as well, too, during his run at Atlanta. So they didn't get a fair shot there, came into the Knicks, got injured again. I mean, he really hasn't done a full season where he can just show you what he can do. And the unfortunate part with this Knicks team is that he's behind, what, Evan Fournier? He's behind R.J. Barrett. And R.J. Barrett's usage rate is off the charts. And it's, all, it's probably going to get higher this season. So, or the, say consistent. When you're behind Barrett in that situation, I don't know how much you're grinding, how much you're, you're going to be playing. They're going to have to make another move. And I think Fournier is going to have to be part of that move. And if that happens that opens up a huge path for, um, for Reddish. And I hope he gets it because, uh, as, as you said, he has a lot of upside. I think he deserves the minutes. I want to mention real quick on that same list, you mentioned Detroit. I got to mention it. Uh, Nick fans, listen, I know you're going to kill me for it. You don't want me to mention his name. I have to mention it. It's Jaden Ivey. You heard? J Jaden Ivey. Let me just say it. The all-to-be-not-Nick, who we all wanted to be a Nick, hoped to be a Nick, hoped to God a fourth, Somebody who was, who was uh, thought to be drafted, probably never going to be drafted past fifth. Nick fans holding on to hope. He's going to drop. He's going to drop. Of course he didn't. Uh, Detroit picks him up. Uh, Cade Cunningham, Jaden Ivey, and Jalen Duran. My goodness. What a little score. Oh, a little, I say little. That's going to be a, a huge spark of a core for uh, Detroit. What do you feel about that um, core? Yeah, that was, um, you know, there was a couple of teams that I'm going through there that were really tough to rank just because of so the vast amount of young talent on there. And there's other teams that I couldn't come up with three because they didn't have three players on the roster that were Boston for younger. one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's Boston, um, uh, Indiana or not. Right. Indiana. Uh, there was uh, a Phoenix. I don't think had any, um, None. that's just, you know, the state of the team that they were in and yeah, like a, a Detroit and Oklahoma city that had 11 players that are 23 or younger. I mean, that's, it was tough to rank. Um, Detroit's right up there. Um, but I, I, I just thought Cade was obviously the number one. Jay Ivey was obviously the number two, number three. I mean, I like Duran. I think he's more of a prospect there. There's a couple of guys that you could put on that list, but yeah, the, the Pistons, I, I, I love, I really love their young core. They got a lot of really good guys. Yeah, I, again, I think that um, I think they're going to be something special. Not not obviously next year. I think they have to have time to no. gel. But give them a few years, that team's going to be scary. Um, I definitely see that, especially with Jaden Ivey. I see a lot of upside in him. He's very explosive. Um, moving on to your other uh, article called um, "Has Every NBA Team Fixed Its Biggest Weakness This Off Season?" I'm just going to skip right over to the uh, Knicks part of that. I'll let um, all of our fans li uh, read that article because. It, uh, I'm, I'm not going to spoil it, but I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an excerpt here. Out of 30 teams, 
there's only like 13, maybe 13, because some of them you kind of said, yeah, they kind of still get it. They mostly got it. So I gave mostly in there a criteria of a yes. So about 13 teams really got a true passing grade of, yeah, they fixed their biggest offseason weakness. So with that in mind, going over to the Knicks, uh, they needed an upgrade at point guard. And they found that upgrade in, for, in uh, point guard with former Dallas Maverick guard Jalen Brunson. As you mentioned in your article, after entering the starting lineup in Dallas last season, he averaged 17.5 points, 4.1 rebounds, 5 assists, and shot 52 point, uh, 50, 50.2% overall and 38.8% uh, from three. For fans, just want to point that out there. The 50.2% he shot overall is near the league leaders. I think only Drew Holiday is higher than him. Drew Holiday. I just wanted to point that out there. So um, for, for some perspective, you also said in that that he wasn't overpaid. He was fairly paid. So yes. I have to. So about so I, I first of all, I agree with you on that. I just want to point that out there. But there are about I want to say 95 percent of other people who absolutely disagree with that statement. They think he's overpaid. They obviously think he's um, not the best upgrade at point guard because he's undersized. He can't defend, they said. All of these particular things that they weren't seeing last year during his run during Dallas when he was doing all the things he was doing during uh, his uh, playoff run with Utah, against Utah, even though Donovan Mitchell, an all-star, stated that JB is for real. You know, they just wanted to put that under the rug until he got the contract. What is your thoughts on um, Jalen Brunson on this Knicks team? And what, do, what do you think he offers to this Knicks team? So I think Jalen Brunson is one of the most divisive uh, players that I've seen graded and analyzed throughout, you know, the last, you know, two months or of the NBA offseason. And I think it's because he entered last year coming off the bench and he went into the summer and got a hundred million dollar contract. And I think a lot of people who weren't paying attention are like, well, well that's definitely an overpay. You know, I've barely heard of this guy. Uh, he, he obviously wasn't good enough to start for Dallas at the beginning of last year. Why are we paying him this much? There's a couple things. Um, number one, if you look at the contract, the way it's structured, it starts at 27 million and it goes down. So that means as the salary cap is going to go up, which is going to go up $10 million next year, if not more, um, we're going to see another cap spike in 2025 or 2026 when new money kicks in, um, where it's going to jump. I don't know, 15, 20 million dollars. We could certainly see a huge spike. Right. And then you're going to have Jalen Brunson, who I don't know if he's going to be an all-star, but he's going to be a really good starter for this next team. You're going to see him down there making 24, 23 million. And all of a sudden that deal is going to look like a steal. And if you're a Knicks fan, what you're hoping for at that time is that he picks up his player option in the fourth year and yes. does not opt out and try to get a bigger deal. Because right. I think at that point, he'll be about 28 years old, and he definitely could. So the way they structured his, structured his contract, and I believe they did the same thing with Mitchell Robinson, started like 17 and, and it's going down, is brilliant. Anytime you can get a player to agree to front load their contract, that gives you a ton of financial flexibility moving forward. And I think that's extremely underrated. I think a lot of people will see $100 million and say, oh my gosh, why did the Knicks give him you have to break it down and look at it. I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this number. Last year, the Knicks uh, overall had a net rating of below zero. It was just barely in the negative overall. If you take out the lineups where Kemba Walker played, so we're going to pretend Kemba Walker didn't play for the Knicks last year, All right. which I think a lot of Knicks fans would like to pretend. If you take that out, their net rating jumps to plus three. If you take that over the course of an NBA season, that would have ranked ninth in the NBA. That would have been better than Philadelphia. That would have wow. been better than Denver. That would have been better than Minnesota, all teams that made the playoffs. And that's only because you take out Kemba Walker. So not only did you take out Kemba Walker, you put in a guy who single-handedly destroyed a franchise in the playoffs if you look at the Utah Jazz because they are just going into a complete rebuild mode now. Uh, that was a series that Dallas should not have had a chance in because Luka Doncic missed the first couple of games. And Jalen Brunson put a playoff team on his shoulders, single-handedly demolished them, and was in the league leaders in points per game in the playoffs for the first round. 
And the Knicks got him for an average of about $26 million a year. I don't, I, I get that that $100 million price tag is going to shock some people. It shouldn't. That's a really good deal for a really good player. And he's going to make a massive impact and improvement for this Knicks team. I just want to point out that Greg just said Jalen Brunson single-handedly destroyed the Jazz franchise. Look and at you the know, Jazz now. <laughs> but he's they right. Down. They said, we're not good enough. Brunson destroyed us. And destroyed as he did, man. I mean, Donovan Mitchell hasn't said anything, but obviously we know what's going on with him. We're going to get into him right away, obviously. But before we get into him, do you think that, because I obviously believe this, we've all kind of said it, but the Gobert trade, is that, the, is that really what broke this? Is that really why this Donovan Mitchell trade hasn't taken off yet? Do you think if that, if the, if that trade didn't happen and Donovan Mitchell's trade happened first, do you think the offer that the Knicks gave of OB, I believe it was, um, what, five first-round picks, five two protected, picks. and uh, yeah, and three protected picks. And I think there's another player in there as well, too, right? Was it uh, quickly, I think? Uh, the, the one from The Athletic was Evan Fournier, OB oh, Evan Fournier, five first-round picks. Right. If you think if that was offered before the Gobert trade goes down, do you think that Ainge takes that? I think Ainge takes that with four first-round picks. I think the Rudy Gobert trade broke the matrix. It completely ruined everything for uh, the Kevin Durant trade, for the Donovan Mitchell trade up to this point. I, like I said, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, going into my 13th year, I've covered the league for a long time, been a fan of the league, uh, 34 years old. I don't get surprised by much. And when I saw what the Minnesota Timberwolves gave up for Rudy Gobert, my jaw dropped. I could not believe it. For a guy that arguably is, I don't want to, I don't want to say overpaid. I want to say overpaid, but he, he makes a lot of money, 40 plus million dollars a year for a guy that has very little offensive game. Now he's, he's one of the best defensive players we've ever seen in NBA history. I don't want to diminish it. Absolutely. But I thought the going rate for Rudy Gobert would be like, man, maybe two first round picks and like some, some salary relief or something like that. And when they got four first round picks, their first round pick from this year in Walker Kessler, uh, you know, Pat Bev and um, um, Malik Beasley and, and, and all the uh, pick swap. I, was, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. And I truly believe Kevin Durant would not be in Brooklyn today if that Rudy Gobert trade does not go down. Because every other trade offer, by comparison, has to beat that. Or else you as a general manager look like a fool. And because of that trade, because of what Minnesota gave up, I firmly believe that's why the, the Donovan Mitchell trade has not gone through yet. I think it still could. And that's why Kevin Durant tro ultimately dropped his trade request and is back in Brooklyn. That trade was so egregious by how much the Minnesota Timberwolves gave up that it, it just broke everything for the rest of the NBA offseason. Yeah, and I, I absolutely I've said the same thing. I, we all kind of said it. it, it legitimately, what do you consider value anymore? I don't even know how you rank value anymore. What is a star? Because is Gobert a, a ultra super mega star? Because it, it sounds like they got LeBron James, but they didn't. That's kind of what it feels like. Because that package alone a couple of years ago would have been a LeBron package and nobody would have batted an eye. Now we don't even, what? I, I don't even know what KD would go for because they were talking about two all-stars. Like for the yeah. Heat, they wanted Bam and they wanted, um, but I think, I know they said Bam and Hero or, you know, a couple of picks and stuff like that. That's, that's crazy. That, Hero's a rising all-star and Bam is one of your anchors. They wanted those two plus picks for Durant. How, I don't even know how you even begin to talk about that. And, and now we're going to go into it. Donovan Mitchell. We just said it, right? He, we, yeah. we think he's going to move. I personally think he moves before training camp just because I think you, I don't, you don't want to go into the season this way. If, you're, if Utah's goal is to tank, you can't have Donovan Mitchell on your team. Because you're going to play him. And if you play him, you're going to win some games. You cannot, you're not going to lose all games playing Donovan Mitchell. He's an all-star for a reason. So you're going to win some games. You're going to have to move him. You want, and also you need, to, you need your teams, like teams need time to gel. And you don't want to go into like mid-season. Like look what happened with Reddish. Perfect example. Going back to Reddish. That's exactly why he didn't play. It would happen the same way. You have to gel. You have to be able to understand what fits and what works. Especially with Tom Thibodeau especially with him. So 
I think it happens before training camp, but I don't know. I don't know to who because apparently Utah has heard two other offers that they really, really like. I don't know why they haven't taken them yet, but they've heard it for the last two days. I still think the Knicks have the best package in terms of picks and players to offer the Jazz. So I, and since that hasn't changed, I don't. I think his destination is still pointed at New York, but maybe I'm wrong here, Greg. What do you think about the Donovan Mitchell situation? What are you hearing from around the league? If Donovan Mitchell is not a Nick, I will be shocked. I will be shocked because the only team really that can beat the Knicks trade package in, in terms of picks is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And the Oklahoma City Thunder are not going to trade for Donovan Mitchell. It doesn't fit in their plan at all. I don't think he would want that. It overlaps with their young core uh, already. I, I don't think that's going to work. Um, that being said, I, I know that the, the Cavaliers were reported that they had interest in him. I don't think that's going to work out at all because the Cavaliers already owe their 2023 first round pick to the Indiana Pacers from the Karis LeVert trade. They can only trade three first round picks in 25, 27, and 29. They don't owe first round picks from anybody else like the Knicks do. And um, our outstanding reporter, Bleach Report, Jake Fisher, has reported all along that Utah wants draft picks. They don't care about young players as much. They don't care about um, all-star level talent coming back. They are going into a full rebuild. They want yeah. picks. Um, some salary relief would be great, I'm guessing. If they get some young players, that's wonderful. But they have prioritized draft picks. And yeah. what team out there is going to give you more draft picks than the Knicks? That there is no team. Like I said, it's not going to be OKC. Um, that's the only team that can top their offer. And right. the fact that the Jazz turned down five first rounders, five, blows my mind. Because all along I thought, okay, maybe maybe they don't want to take less than what they got for Rudy Gobert. Okay. Maybe, even four first round picks. Let's just match the deal and we'll throw in some young talent if you're New York and be like, okay, that, that's something that can work for everybody. Um, but you're also going to argue about which picks get thrown in. You know, is it a future unprotected pick from the Knicks? Is it a uh, 2023 protected first round pick from a team like Dallas? Draft pick value matters. And I think that's probably what it's going to come down to as well. Um, ultimately, it, like you said, the Jazz, it, all signs are pointing to the Jazz not wanting to be good. They want to rebuild. They gave a very young coach. He's my age. They gave a very, well, okay. He's young for a coach, but not young for a sports writer. Um, he's, <laughs> he's, he, they gave him a five-year deal. And you can't sabotage your young coach by throwing him into training camp in media day. And the first 10 questions he's going to get on media day are about Donovan Mitchell. Why is Donovan Mitchell still here? Do you think Donovan Mitchell is going to be traded? You can't do that to your first-year head coach. I really don't think so. Um, if you're the Jazz, you you take that five first round pick deal from the Knicks, and you you know if you can get Quentin Grimes, if you can get Manuel Quickly, Cam Reddish, whoever else, that's great. You iron that out, and then you trade Mike Conley, and then you trade uh, Boyan Bogdanovich, and then you trade Jordan Clarkson. You just strip the whole thing down, and you try to be bad because the 2023 draft class is going to be loaded. And if you go into the season with Donovan Mitchell and you are still decent. Maybe not playoff good, but still decent, and you miss out on that first round pick, you're sabotaging your future. Utah can't be too cute with this. They need to say, nobody's beaten five first round picks from the Knicks. Nobody. Let's get this trade done. We're going to be worse, which is ultimately going to make us better. The Knicks would get what they want. Donovan Mitchell presumably would get what he wants. I, I'm sure he'd love to play in New York, and yep. then everybody would be happy. I think that's what needs to happen. So it's been reported that the reason for the, at least the, why the Utah Jazz rejected it is because the Knicks offered two unprotected picks and Utah wanted four. I just can't even begin to wrap my head around four unprotected picks. And I just want people to understand. People don't understand this point. I have to really mention it. Do you understand why unprotected picks from the Knicks are different <laughs> than any other team? Do you understand that the Knicks have been bad for as almost as long as I've been alive? Most years, they've been terrible. So what does that mean? Likely in the lottery. What does that mean? You're likely getting a top pick. That's why the Knicks picks are the most desirable. 
We gave them two of those picks. They wanted four. Here we are. Trey's not happening. I don't know who's going to move the needle anymore. I think it goes to six picks, three unprotected, three uh, protected. Probably going to be the Bucks one because it's, it's the higher of the protected. I believe it's top five protected in 2025, I think, uh, that we got that pick from, right? So I think that's going to be included. You're probably going to have the Dallas pick included. And I don't know, one of these other crappy picks that we got. They're crappy because they're like, they're so high up that it, they're probably going to, you know, either phase out into a second round. They're just, it's just not going to matter. So that's why I say it's, it's likely going to be a package around that. I don't know the players. I would, I really, maybe because I'm just, it's the nick in me. I really hope they don't take Grimes. I, I have to say it. I said it on Twitter. I said it everywhere. Please. I, I'm going to ask really nicely. Please. Please don't trade RJ Barrett. Please don't trade him. If you're bringing Mitchell in, you want Mitchell. You want Spider to play with RJ. Imagine that. Why would you take that away? And he's the most beloved Nick since probably Ewing. I talk about something that would not only destroy your franchise internally, but the fan base would. Oh my God, I can only imagine the riot. Um, but just going back to RJ, his his contract is coming up. You didn't mention it looming, right? The Athletic was pulled. Fred Katz pulled them. 16 NBA front offices said that they wouldn't give RJ a max. They liked four years, 100 million. They didn't want to give him really more than that. Um, I agree. I don't think he goes for that. They're probably going to offer him that or maybe less. Um, but they're definitely, he's definitely not going to take that. He's definitely going to go for playing. The, I think he's going to go the Ingram route and play for that contract. Uh, I, I, think he, I think he has to make a statement in game one um, when he plays the, the Grizzlies. And it's on the road. And I think that's going to be a big step and game for him. Uh, what do you think about um, the Knicks this season, though? The Given their current roster, let's forget about Donovan and Mitchell for a second. Got Jalen Brunson. Obviously, the lineup as probably constructed now is going to be probably Jalen Brunson, uh, Evan Fournier, or R.J. Barrett, Evan Fournier, Julius Randle, and probably Mitchell Robinson. How far does that lineup get you? So I wrote a, an article that came out yesterday at Bleacher Report um, about five teams that could really kind of surprise us this year. Could kind of, you know, teams that maybe took a step back last year or young teams that are still trying to find their way, trying to identify, you know, the next, uh, the next Cavaliers team, the next uh, Minnesota Timberwolves team that kind of made that jump from either 20 wins, to 30 wins up in the 40s. Um, the New York Knicks made my list. and. Um, I gave you the stat before about just swapping out Kemba Walker made a huge impact. Um, if you take out the lineups with Kemba Walker and Evan Fournier, and let's pretend those two weren't on the roster last year, their net rating jumps all the way to plus 5.3, which would make them a top five, six ish team in the NBA just by removing those two players. If I were the Knicks, I would try to explore every trade possible for Evan Fournier that I possibly could. And I understand he's, he's a good shooter. He's a good floor spacer. He gives you some offensive pop. He's not a good defender. Um, at times he, he's not a, a real efficient shooter from anywhere from, you know, outside easy wide open threes. Um, and I, I don't think he's really a starting caliber player unless you have the right pieces around him. And I don't think he's a great fit with this team. But just to see how high their net rating would jump just by taking those two players away, that's got to be encouraging. Um, if you look after the All-Star break last year, the Knicks, I believe, had the best defensive rating in all of basketball after the All-Star break, like the final 15, 18 games of the season. So this team has not forgot how to defend. It hasn't. Um, you just added uh, in free agency – not only bringing back Mitchell Robinson, but you added Isaiah Hartenstein, who I got to watch play in Cleveland for a little bit and knew nothing about him coming over from the Denver Nuggets in a, in a trade for JaVale McGee. And I was blown away by his room protection, his passing ability, his feel for the game. And when he went and signed like a, a non-guaranteed deal with the Clippers last year, I thought this, this, is, this guy is going to get himself paid. And he got, he did, he got a nice contract, two years, 16 million. So you're adding in Isaiah Hartenstein who had a better uh, defensive rim, uh, 
defensive rim percentage against um, opponents at the rim last year than Rudy Gobert, than Miles Turner, than Jared Allen, um, than Mitchell Robinson. He was below 50% um, allowing opponents to shoot at the rim. I mean, just an unbelievable number on a pretty good sample size. So you add that in behind Mitchell Robinson, you have a real defensive anchor. Um, I don't think Julius Randle will be as bad as he was last year. I don't think he'll be as good as he was two years ago. But if you can get him somewhere in the middle where, you know, maybe he makes 36% of his threes and he's a willing passer and now you have Jalen Brunson. So he doesn't have to do as much of the playmaking. He doesn't have to do as much of the scoring. Brunson's going to help get him in his sweet spots. He's going to play with him in the pick and roll and he's going to get him some easy buckets that, you know, Kemba Walker didn't do. I think the Knicks um, at a minimum are going to be a play in team and I could see them coming out of the play in tournament and getting that seven or eight seed. I'm not going to put them ahead of the elites in the East. I'm not going to put them above the Boston, the Milwaukee, the Miami, um, all those teams. I'm not going to do that, but it's addition by subtraction. You got rid of Kemba Walker, what you needed to do. Um, you're going to miss Alec Burks a little bit. I liked him. He was a good three point shooter, multi multi positional defender, but the addition of Brunson, the, addi the addition of Hartenstein were so huge. I'm a little afraid of Evan Fournier kind of messing this up. Um, I would rather just move him and let, you know, the Quentin Grimeses of the world and the, the uh, Cam Reddishes of the world get a little bit more run, get a little bit more consistent role. Um, I think the Knicks are uh, a playing team, and I think they have a chance of coming out and getting the seven or eight seed in the East. I actually agree with that. I mentioned that as well, too. I think they can buy um, for eighth. I wanted to speak a little bit about Julius Randle, though. He looks slimmer now. He's, um, you know, I saw the pro-ams, obviously. He looks, uh, he looks like he's working on his shot. His shot looks better. He obviously looks a lot slimmer. I mentioned that him and Obi are playing a lot as well, too. They, I mean, a lot of the games that they're playing uh, during these workouts, I, I've seen Julius Randle and Obi Toppin playing. So I got my mind thinking, um, how could those two play together? Do you see potentially a lineup? And I mentioned this before, and I, again, maybe I'm crazy here, but do you potentially see stretches of a lineup that could include Jalen Brunson, RJ Barrett, Julius Randle potentially at the three, Obi Toppin at the four, and Mitchell Robinson at the five? Last year, when you played Julius and Obi, you gave up that defense that you had. So if you add Mitch there, you get a defensive anchor. You also get uh, somebody who can get those rebounds for you as well, clean up the paint. Uh, Julius is not a terrible defender during his all-star run. He was a you know, pretty decent defender as well, too. Toppin's getting better. RJ is obviously getting better. Uh, so what do you think about that potential lineup? Do you think that could, you could see th that lineup uh, during this next season? I think offensively it could work for sure. Um, I yeah. think defensively is where the, the question would be. You said he, you mentioned he lost weight. He looks slimmer and he would have to be, to be able to play on the wing, you know, if yeah. you're going up against, and you know, I, I throw these names out there, but a, a LeBron, a Kawhi Leonard, a Paul George, somebody, you know, who's going to play on the wing, who's going to be, you know, combined strength and speed. Is he going to be able to keep up with them? Is he going to be able to guard them out on the perimeter? You know, he can hold his own in the paint, you know, if they try to, uh, back him down or something like that but could he keep up with them on the perimeter uh i don't know i i i that wouldn't be my first choice to line up i'd rather see him you know stick at power forward maybe play some small ball five for stretches where they need some added offense um it's not a position i would keep him at all the time but um that that would certainly be interesting like you said um in the summer they've we've seen him and, and obi playing side by side together Mm -hmm. you know, take it with a grain of salt. It's a pro am, you know, it's pretty free flowing. They're not uh, <laughs> running design plays out here or anything, but yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it's something you could ex uh, experiment with and it gets Evan Fournier off the court. So uh, that would be fine too. I'd be okay with that. Yeah. So uh, as long as you've got Jalen Brunson out there, you got RJ Barrett. Um, I, th I think you will be good. My question is, let's say they get Donovan Mitchell and then all of a sudden, you know, Donovan's your two, Jalen's your one. RJ now becomes your three. Now you're probably going to have to play a little bit smaller. And, and, and RJ's got good size. He can play the two or the three. It doesn't really matter. But yeah. um, that that's a lineup I would be very intrigued to see if they could get Donovan. Just having three guys that can attack off the dribble, can create for others. And then you've got Julius, a big guy that can, you know, he can pick and pop. You can play make from him with, with him from the elbows. He's a good passer. And then you have your defensive banker 
in a Mitchell Robinson or Isaiah Hartstein. That's a lineup that's really intriguing. I, I, I definitely would love to see that lineup. And you can definitely put, I was going to say, you could definitely insert Hartenstein over Mitch in that um, particular lineup as well, too. And if you do that, because he's a super underrated passer, uh, Hartenstein's a great passer. So, you know, he, he'll give you that a little bit of inside uh, the uh, paint type of passing that really Jokic is the one who really gives you now. I'm not saying he's Jokic-like, but in terms of the having that mindset and that uh, skill to do that. Uh, so we spoke about programs. I just want to talk about that again because it's an unfortunate thing. I don't like talking about injuries, but unfortunately, uh, Chet Holmgren uh, suffered an injury um, today on his uh, foot. I believe it's a Linz Frank injury is what they called it. Uh, he's done for the entire season. Uh, very, very unfortunate. Uh, hard to hear because, I mean, he, in terms of his size, his talent, and where he was projected, um, vies for rookie of the year. So what do you think about, you know, this injury, obviously, to this really uh, talented uh, young star? Yeah, I mean, he's one of the top guys I was looking forward to watch just because, I mean, you just don't see guys built like him with his defensive ability, um, with his length, with his ability to, to shoot threes, to handle the ball. I mean, you just don't see guys like that. He's like a more athletic Kristaps Porzingis. Like he's, oh, should I not say that name on a Knicks podcast? Is that? And not say that. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, he's like a, uh, moving he's, on. <clears throat> he's like a he's like a really tall guy that's athletic and uh, can defend. So um, OKC okay, was uh, that was a team that uh, I put on my list too for teams that could shock people. And I I said you know not because they're going to make the playoffs, they're not, but they're a team that could be you know by March in the conversation for a play-in spot. I really believe that because. You've got two guys now, um, you know, the uh, Shea Gilgis, Alexander, Lou Dorth, who are on their second contract. So good. And Josh Giddy, who looked really good as a rookie. And then yes. you add in, you know, some good rookies this year, headlined by Chet Holmgren. And oh. I thought he's a guy that, you know, is going to make all defensive teams in his career. He mm -hmm. could win defensive player of the year at some point when he puts on more muscle. And, you know, for his rookie year to just be taken from him um, for tearing a ligament in his foot, I mean, just. It's something I think people are going to look at and be like, should guys not play in pro-am? Should they not do this? Well, I mean, guys can get hurt working out. You know right. what I mean? Guys yeah. can get hurt. You want your, your, your players to play basketball during the summer. That's what you want them to do. Are you going to tell guys not to play in the Olympics? Are you going to tell guys not to play in FIBA? Are you going to tell them not to play um, in their overseas tournaments? No, you're not going to do that. So right. I, I think it, it is what it is. It's an unfortunate injury, but at the end of the day, it, it shouldn't stop guys from, from playing in programs and playing in, um, off season basketball. Yeah. And what an injury to have, you know, as a big man, you know, the one type of injury you don't want to have is a foot injury or anything with your knees or your legs. So, um, you know, and obviously that was one of the concerns as well too, when he was playing in summer league, I know a lot of people were talking about how he was getting bullied into the paint, uh, quite a bit, uh, in terms of his frame. I think obviously KP was the same way when he came in and, um, you know, he kind of added a little muscle. He's definitely injury prone. I can't say he's not, but, uh, yeah. But in terms of like getting stronger underneath, it's possible he's, he's done. He doesn't get bullied like he used to in, in his uh, first couple of seasons. So obviously I think it could be done, but uh, what, a, what a way to go. Um, I, I wish him the best. I hope he gets uh, full, full recovery, no issues. Hope he comes back, red shirts it next year and does a Ben Simmons and wins rookie of the year that year. Because um, I think he's that talented to, um, to do it. Talent. Talent seems to be floating all in New York. And there's another team right across. I don't even, I mean, I, I, yesterday I didn't know what was happening. Today I didn't know what was happening. I feel like I hear that KD doesn't like Nash, doesn't like the GM, wants them to go away, then had a meeting in private, and now everything's okay after a dinner or drinks or whatever. Greg, can you can you shed some light on what's going on in Brooklyn? Is, is this KD, Kyrie situation, quote-unquote, fixed? Nothing with Kyrie Irving is ever fixed. <laughs> I, uh, I, I got the opportunity to cover Kyrie up close and personal when he was in Cleveland. And oh, yeah. I, I have described Kyrie and, and Kevin Durant as this. They are the two most miserable superstars I've ever seen. And I don't say that to be mean. I don't say that uh, to degrade them in any way. But when Kyrie was with the Cavs and he hit the biggest shot in franchise history and won the title in 2016, um, his, there's a story where his uh, teammates found him on, or his dad and his sister came down and found him on the court and he, he just wasn't happy. And they said, what's wrong? 
and he was just he was concerned about his assist numbers or his shooting numbers for that game and it was like what <laughs> what who cares you just won the championship like you just what like it's like there's something in him where he just cannot be happy. And I really feel bad for him. I really do because I, I wrote many articles in 2011 leading up to the draft about why the Cavs should take him. And he's just such a terrific talent. Oh, he's yeah. such a great young man. He gives great interviews. He's got a great head on his shoulder. He's very well-spoken. He's the right leader for this team. I was all in on Kyrie. And that's mm-hmm. not the case. It was Kyrie versus Derek Williams at the time. It was kind of split. I was all in on Kyrie. Cut came to Cleveland, won Rookie of the Year. Um, obviously, gave the Cavs fans something to cheer for in the in the dark years of 2011 to 2014 before LeBron came back. Mm-hmm. And I, I I've seen very few players as talented as him. Even like Darius Garland now in Cleveland, a max contract and All Star, he doesn't hold a candle in terms of talent oh, to no. Kyrie Irving. And no disrespect to Darius Garland, Kyrie is that good. So the fact that Kyrie has now gone from Cleveland where he won a championship and then all of, this, all of a sudden decided, I don't want to be here. Okay, goes to Boston, takes shots at Cleveland, takes shots at, uh, he's now in a, in a real sports town, uh, called Brad Stevens uh, a cerebral coach. And he finally, he always wanted to play for a cerebral coach, taking a shot at Ty Lue, who was, Ty Lue was a fantastic coach. That was right. such a stupid thing for him to say. Um, makes it two years there leaves goes to brooklyn tried to get out he tried to get out he tried to get a sign and trade his the nets gave him permission to try to get a team to agree to trade for him and he couldn't find it (laughs) which is why a player as talented as him if you're trying to look for a reason why he's just on an expiring player option he couldn't even opt out and get a new deal and get a raise Mm. that's how bad it was uh and you mix in Kevin Durant, who for the last two months has wanted out, who wanted the coach fired, who wanted the general manager fired. How is that going to work the first day of training camp when he shows up and and Nash calls everybody in the huddle? Who's going to listen to Nash? And Nash is a great guy. I love watching Nash play. Um, He and I were actually uh, co-workers. He wrote about soccer for Bleacher Report for about a year. Um, Yeah, not a lot of people know that uh because he's such a soccer fiend too and yeah he definitely I, I just don't know how that's going to work i don't know how you come back from that um good for the nets i guess for not giving into everything that they wanted um yeah. but at the end of the day you have the three most unreliable stars in the league in Kyrie Irving, kevin gray and ben simmons and Ooh. when you need locker room leadership when you need somebody to hold guys accountable, because this is important. This is very important. I was in a locker room that had LeBron James, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Love that looked miserable most nights. And then they traded for Channing Fry, And it completely changed everything. You need good veterans. You need James Jones. You need Channing Fry. You need Richard Jefferson. You need guys like that to hold guys accountable. Kevin Durant is still going to be the voice in that locker room. And people won't know if he's in or out. Kyrie Irving is going to be one of the big voices in that locker room on an expiring contract. People don't know if he's in or out. Ben Simmons, we haven't seen him in over a year. Is his back okay? Does he want to play? I don't know. And as much talent is on the Brooklyn Nets roster, chemistry matters. Veteran leadership matters. Locker room cohesion matters matters i've seen it up close and personal i've been in the Cavs locker rooms when it was good when it was bad all that stuff matters talent only gets you so far i i don't see the brooklyn nets having a good season and if they make the playoffs i think it's going to be a quick exit Kyrie's probably not going to resign who knows what's going to happen with ben simmons and then we could find ourselves right back to where we are with kevin durant requesting a trade do you think kevin durant is the type of player that would come to camp and not give it his all, that would go into a game and not give it his all, given that, let's say he doesn't, he agreed to stay with Brooklyn, of course. Let's say he doesn't want to play for Brooklyn, like kind of like what James Harden did when he was with, uh, you know, Houston. Um, do you think he, he has that in him where he can show up and not ball to his fullest abilities? 
Well, James Harden came into camp at, in, in Houston, probably 30 pounds overweight. So I don't think Kevin Durant's going to do that. <laughs> I'd like to see what Kevin Durant would look like 30 pounds overweight. Uh, he'd probably weigh about 150 pounds. Um, probably look normal. <laughs> he probably wouldn't be skinny man no more. <laughs> right. So I, no, I don't, I don't see that happening. I think Durant is always going to be seven foot tall and 210 pounds. And he's always going to love to play basketball and he's never going to sit out. And I think he's, he's, and there's many, but I think he's one of the guys that truly does love playing basketball. He truly does. Um, I don't think he always knows where he wants to play basketball, but he does love to play basketball. So I don't think he's going to sit out. I don't think he's going to, you know, uh, take a hiatus like we've seen Kyrie Irving do in the past. Um, if he's healthy, he's going to play. And I don't think the Nets should have any any concern about that. So um, lastly today, before I let you go, Greg, I got to ask, because it does affect the Knicks kind of, I guess, in a way. The Jazz did make a trade yesterday. Yes, they did. But not for Donovan Mitchell. Uh, they traded Patrick Beverly uh, to the Lakers for Stanley Johnson. And uh, who was the other player that they traded Jaylen for him? Jalen Horton Tucker. Jalen Horton Tucker. THT. Uh, getting a restart, actually, which is, I actually am very happy for that. I think he needs to have the ball in his hands. I think he'll have the opportunity to uh, do that over there. What was your thoughts on the move that the Lakers made? Um, did you understand why they made it? And where does Patrick Beverly fit with a Lakers team with Russ on it? It was a really good trade for the Lakers. It was really good. Um, Taylor and Horton Tucker, I think they they squeezed that lemon as much as they could. I think they saw that there's talent there. He's a horrible fit with this roster. Yeah. He's a guy that needs to have the ball in his hands. He's one of the worst three-point shooters in the entire NBA. You can't put bad three-point shooters next to LeBron James. That's not a recipe for success. You mm -hmm. need the Kyle Corvers. You need the, like I said, the James Jones. You need guys, the Channing Fries that can stand and shoot. Yeah. Um, you know, that's why when LeBron was in Cleveland, they Deion Waiters didn't last. You know, they traded him in, in, in the deal that brought him J.R. Smith and Ramon Shumper. And what happened? They won a championship because they put the right pieces around. Uh, Patrick Beverly, he's, he's not in his prime. Uh, he's 33, 34 years old. Mm -hmm. um, but he's still a good defender. He's still a good three-point shooter. He, he's got a little playmaking left in him. Uh, if he's your starting point guard and your primary playmaker, you're in trouble. But you have LeBron James, so he's not going to have to be that. Um, I think he's a really good fit for them. I think he's a guy that, if he's in the right frame of mind can be a good locker room voice. Uh, we've seen him lose his cool on the court with shoving Chris Paul and other instances where he's probably not proud of, but yeah. um, he made a very, he, he was a very important player for the Wolves last year. Mm -hmm. Very important, especially for a young team that had playoff aspirations and you need guys like that. So I think he's a good addition. He's a good fit next to LeBron. He's a good uh, point of attack defender still, even at his age. Um, and I think it's, kind of pushed if there was any doubt any doubt at all that they were going to trade russell westbrook i think this will help kind of uh, silence those doubts because those two have a history they clearly do not like each other i don't think they're going to get along as teammates and i think this was the the lakers giving themselves like okay now if we trade russell we don't necessarily need to get a point guard back because we have kendrick nunn and now we have patrick beverly and we have LeBron James as a primary playmaker. So I think it gives them more options in a Russell Westbrook trade. And I think it definitely, if we're not at, it's a 100% chance that he's gone, we're at like a 99% chance that Russell Westbrook is going to be gone, um, presumably before the season starts. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just, I saw the report actually before we got on that, um, that it's likely that Russ is no longer a Laker before the yeah. season starts. And uh, yeah, I mean, if if nobody's, Please Google Russell Westbrook and Patrick Beverly. Just go on YouTube and, 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 just, and just give yourself about five minutes of time. Sit down. If you're having it in the morning, have a coffee. If it's the afternoon, have a sandwich. Just take five minutes out of your day. Watch the video. And then you'll understand why these two cannot play together. Uh, and and I, Patrick Beverly did, I think, offered a little bit of an olive branch because LeBron commented on somebody's uh, Twitter post about Russell Westbrook saying, you know, um, he's going to, you know, he's, he's going to show, he's going to show up this season. He's going to do what he needs to do. Shut up all the haters. And Patrick Beverly commented saying, you know, yeah, you know, uh, we got, we got Brody's back or something, something along that effect. He's not, 
watch the video on YouTube. And then you'll, again, you'll understand why they, they can't play together. I don't think Russ is going to be a Laker, but then I, I don't know where he goes. Um, and I don't, I, again, I don't know how to answer that. I don't know where he's going to end up. It would be so funny if he, uh, if he became a Nick and, uh, the, the Lakers traded for Randall, that would be a funny thing. I know it's been thrown out there quite a bit. Um, but, uh, yeah, the Russell Westbrook story is going to be a fun one to follow. I just want to say uh, thanks so much to Greg Schwartz for joining us today. You can follow him on Twitter. I'll be posting that all on the video and the chat everywhere, so you'll be seeing that everywhere. Um, by the way, he's, again, a 12-plus year goaded Bleacher Report writer. If you're not reading his articles, again, they're going to be posted in the links for uh, the description. But please, just Google Greg Schwartz. Read some of his NBA articles. They will get you to understand basketball just a little bit more because, he, again, he's probably most – objective Bleacher Report uh, writer that I've read articles from. So I just want to say again, thank you, Greg, for joining uh, the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on. You, you said too many nice things about me, though. I definitely don't deserve them, but I appreciate it. Of course, of course. Next time I'll, I'll dull it down just a little bit. <laughs> All right, everybody. Again, thanks so much for joining us with another episode of The Knicks Recap. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow us. Until next time, Knicks fans, peace. Listen to new episodes of The Knicks Recap, streaming every Friday.